Oh, so good afternoon, students, and good morning, Professor Aoife. <laughs> um, so today we have a chance to listen to a lecture about uh, carbon emission uh, related to buildings. But before we start to the lecture, uh, we will listen the opening session from Bu Dewi. It's a short one. So Bu Dewi, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you Bu Fenty. Uh, good afternoon everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore semuanya. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for our guest lecture, Professor Awife Holy Weber. Sorry. <laughs> Not correct with <laughs> to call your name. Okay, uh, thank you for your time and willingness uh, to share your experience, your knowledge uh, about the how to reduce the future carbon for us, for uh, the lecture, and also for our student. Uh, and also, this, uh, the secondly, I would like to say also uh, thank you for uh, the uh, lecture and also students for your coming uh, this uh, afternoon to see the this guest lecture. Okay, I think uh, now we will uh, tell about the, the topic about the uh, reducing the future carbon or uh, especially about the climate mitigation, roughly to zero emission building and neighborhood in smart city. Wow, it's very good topic. And I hope uh, that uh, this is will be uh, enlarged uh, the knowledge for the student and also for us about how to reduce the carbon. Okay, I think it's enough, Bu Fenty, and uh, you can continue uh, the, this class. And then for uh, Professor, I don't know how to call you, but I- Ifa. Oh, okay. Ifa. 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 <laughs> Professor Ifa yeah. is not this guest lecture. Thank you okay. very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore. Sorry. So thank you, Bu Devi. So um, now we know how to uh, now we know how to call Professor Eva. <laughs> it's a little bit tricky, but yeah, now I know it. Um, so uh, without further ado, we have to listen to your lecture so that we can save some time to maybe have more discussion rather than uh, only listening to your lecture. So. Now the screen is yours, Professor. Please, you can start okay. the lecture. So thank you very much, Bu Dewi and Bu Fenty. Yeah, <laughs> um, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. I was delighted when uh, Bu Fenty um, contacted me because previously I had worked in uh, Malaysia and Hong Kong, and we're looking to develop a collaboration in the Asia Southeast Asian region. So it was just perfect timing. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a professor at the Belfast School of Architecture and director of the newly launched architectural research group in the UK. Um, I just returned actually to the UK after working in uh, Norway for 10 years. And um, so I was working there at the Research Center for Net Zero Emission in Smart Cities. So I'll just uh, give you a little overview about the structure of the talk. So I thought, first of all, it's very important to set the context about climate emergency and climate change mitigation. So why is it important for you, the next generation of architects, to take this under um, consideration? And then secondly, you know, there's a plethora of different approaches around the world. So it's important for you uh, to understand what is meant by net zero. So I'll just give a very short overview to what is actually meant by the term. And then the fun bit, because you probably will get bored of all the uh, theory aspect. So then I thought I can highlight some design strategies from uh, the pilot projects that have actually been built in Norway, which demonstrate different pathways to achieving uh, lower and zero emissions. And then finally, I'd just like to end up with, you know, if possible, just highlighting the importance uh, of bridging this gap between the research, which is really crucial, but how do we bring it into design uh, so that you can build buildings with a lower environmental impact? So, 
how oh, let me i'm just going to uh, minimize those uh, your photos on the right side so i can see the full screen let me just move that perfect so as you're aware a climate emergency has been declared so we as architects what action are we going to take so a recent IPCC report stresses we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by almost half before 2030 and reach net zero emission by 2050, if not before. And the message in the report is giving a very clear warning that we need to act fast and we need to act decisively. So what we're seeing already is the associated effects of climate change are resulting in global warming, sea level rise, as shown in the maps here. Um, but what we're seeing is that these um, extreme weather effects are happening, happening uh, with more fre frequency and, you know, they're becoming more intense. So as you've seen, you know, hurricanes, uh, we've been looking at the Caribbean region um, and the Bahamas. And what we're seeing is those hurricanes are much more forceful and they're, they're happening with a lot more frequency. And associated with the hurricanes, you get, um, you know, a tidal surge, for example, you know, resulting in six feet of water increase. So this is having a really devastating effect on those low lying um, island communities, uh, particularly in the Caribbean region. So I'm sure this is the same issue for you uh, about, you know, tidal surge and flooding in sort of remote island um, communities. So it's really important that we start changing the way that we design now uh, because the effects are so clear and the, how would you say, the effects of the climate change are happening much quicker than anticipated. And as you're aware, you know, there's more and more wildfire fires and fluctuations in temperatures happening all over the world. And as you may be familiar, you know, air pollution is a big issue as well. So in response to this, a climate, climate emergency declarations have been declared worldwide and local governments are taking action to put in place policy that will really help to reduce emissions. So the reduction of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector is an urgent priority to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees centigrade in this century. On the, in November 2019, the European Parliament declared an, a climate emergency. So what do we mean by climate emergency? It's a situation in which urgent action is required to reduce or halt climate change and avoid potential irreversible environmental damage which results from it. So global impact of buildings. Well, why is it important to look at the building sector? Uh, so building construction and operation um, account for almost 40%, let's say, of global final energy use and almost 40% of energy related CO2 emissions. So it's really clear that improving the energy performance of the building stock and developing zero emission building concepts are critical to avoid an increase in energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. So what's happening in Europe is there's uh, legislation now in place um, for NZEBs. And what they mean by NZEB is nearly zero energy buildings. So they're not talking about nearly or net zero emission buildings, which have the same acronym. So just to be clear of that difference. But the primary objective of that legislation is to mitigate climate change and to help the EU transition to a zero carbon economy by 2050. NZEBs have a very high energy performance and low energy is required to come from uh, renewable sources, such as photovoltaic panels. So according to the European Parliament, all new buildings within the EU should be nearly zero energy by the end of 2020. So that legislation is in force now. So EU countries have to draw up their national plans to increase NZEB uh, uptake in practice. So what's happening in the UK is that um, a net zero emission legislation has now been uh, put in place uh, so that all buildings um, should be net zero by 2050. So, you know, the, the 
there's many initiatives happening all over the world, as I said. Um, you know, so each country is, you know, either working to a net zero carbon goal, net zero energy goal, net zero emission goal. So, you know, even though there is a, quite a difference in um, the terminology, it's really good to see that all, all countries are taking action through, you know, this could be uh, through legislation, as I said, in the UK and the EU. But it's also voluntary initiatives such as certification schemes, for example, or like I mentioned uh, to uh, Bu Fenty um, earlier about the Indonesian Green Building Council also have a campaign about advancing net zero. So you can also have a look at uh, Leti, L-E-T-I dot com. I'm not sure I put the... Um, website on, but they have uh, some nice, easy to understand material on achieving net zero targets. Uh, they have sort of nice uh, one pagers, which highlight, you know, the key requirements for new buildings and those sort of key steps that we can take uh, towards achieving a net zero um, emission building. So have a look at leti.com. That's quite good, a uh, nice source of material. And then, as I said, you know, the Green Building Council, if you look on the World Green, Gu uh, Green Building Council website, um, you know, again, they've made some really nice, clear, easy to understand infographics. And um, so, you know, the key message here is that by 2030, all new buildings must operate at net zero carbon. And by 2050, 100% of all buildings must operate at net zero carbon. And you'll see on the right, you know, the key principles are measuring and disclosing uh, the carbon. So the emissions from operation, embodied emissions from materials. Another key step is reducing energy demand, generating a balance. So the energy that you use in the building should be sourced from renewable source. And um, so you're creating that balance. Um, and also making it really um, much more rigorous about the verification um, of those, um, how do you say, invoices that you're submitting, etc. So what I've highlighted here on the right, um, I'm not going to go into detail with it right now, but just to highlight to you, uh, the Green Building Council has done these um, country profiles. So you can see on the right hand side. So for various countries, they've sort of a snapshot. What is the definition? What are the key steps to achieving net zero? So you can see here then, I've just highlighted uh, what is the definition um, in the UK according to Green Building Council. So according to them, net zero is uh, for operational energy is achieved when the amount of carbon emissions associated with the building's operational energy on an annual basis is zero or negative. So what this means is that the let's say the kilowatt hours or the megajoules that you use in your building, you know, to, to run lighting, air conditioning, whatever. So that energy should be balanced by an equivalent amount of, um, for example, electricity from photovoltaic cells. Then you're sort of balancing demand with supply. So that's essentially what is meant by a sort of net zero um, operational energy uh, balance. I'll go into this in a bit more detail afterwards, but just again, highlighting, you know, in the US and, um, you know, they're dealing with uh, zero energy and zero carbon. So again, when they talk about zero energy, it's about balancing the energy use with renewables. When they talk about zero carbon, they're taking it into account not only, um, you know, the energy use, but also trying to balance the embodied emissions from the materials. So all the materials you use in the building have a carbon, how do you say, quota or footprint, and you're trying to balance those as well as the energy use. So then, uh, like I said, you know, I did a quick search uh, on Indonesia, and um, so I found uh, this one pager, and I'm sure Bu Fenty and Bu Dewi know more about this, um, but at least it's a good source uh, for you to refer to, and you can see down in the bottom right, uh, there's a website link uh, to the Indonesian uh, specific resources. 
So, you know, I won't go into too much detail, uh, but just, you know, to highlight, as I said before, in different countries, there's different definitions, different approaches. Um, and I'm not saying that bad or good, you know, it's actually showcasing a lot of uh, motivation and goodwill to actually do something, but it can lead to a lot of confusion um, about what is actually meant by the term. So you probably won't be interested in this, but if you are, uh, we've just published um, a paper as part of um, International Energy Agency, Annex 72. Um, so you can download that on the bottom left. Uh, but essentially what we wanted to do was um, to try to make it easier, you know, to develop a more standard approach that's more transparent and more rigorous. Um, so it's like a framework, uh, you know, for worldwide use, uh, but obviously it would have a lot of flexibility within that, uh, you know, for the needs of different countries where it can be applied. So the starting point to the research was to actually analyze what's out there. So we looked at um, 33 different schemes from around the world and we just analyzed what were the key parameters, boundaries, performance targets mentioned in those standards and schemes. And then we did an analysis of the different terms, uh, calculation methodology, which I'm not getting into, but out of that to start to develop a pro proposals uh, for a more systemized um, approach and harmonized framework so that we kind of address this confusion and really to avoid greenwashing. So just a snapshot again of the, the key results. What we saw is that, you know, the majority of these different, whether it's legislation or like initiatives like, um, you know, the Green Building Council, which is voluntary, um, is that energy consumption is still the most common um, metric. So that means that uh, they're dealing with achieving that balance, net zero energy balance, so not including the life cycle emissions and embodied emissions of the materials. However, so that's shown basically in blue, um, but green is showing you where um, there's a shift taking place where we're seeing, you know, obviously the importance these buildings uh, to achieve a low energy building and usually you achieve that through using materials that unfortunately have an, a higher embodied emission impact. So the key is really, um, if you don't include that part about the materials, then you're missing a huge part of the, the picture because you know if you're just achieving a balance between energy demand and energy supply, well, of course, you could still have a building that has a very high energy demand and just put in more PV and you've got your net zero energy balance. But that's not what we're, we should be um, striving for. It's really about creating buildings that have a low, that are producing less greenhouse gas emissions, essentially. So we need to take into account the emissions part. So just uh, to highlight, you know, just in Norway, for example, we talk about net zero en emission buildings. In the UK, it's net zero carbon, uh, but actually they're talking about the same thing. <laughs> so just to be aware, it's about emissions from operation and embodied emissions from materials. And in the US, they talk about uh, LEED zero carbon or zero carbon buildings. And it would be interesting, obviously, to look at Indonesia uh, going forward. And like I said, we're collaborating um, with Singapore already, so that wouldn't uh, be unfeasible. So, um, yeah, I don't think I'll go into this too much, but just to sort of highlight, you know, in Singapore, it's uh, zero energy buildings and you can see all the different terminologies here. Um, and essentially another big difference is some countries are talking about, you know, as I said, that balance for energy. Others are including in energy and embodied emissions. Some are measuring only on an annual basis, whereas others are dealing with it over its lifetime. And we're taking a lifetime of, say, 60 years. So I'll, I'll go into that. So it's sort of thinking about that future, you know, um, how would you say not just calculating for today, but assuming, you know, that that building will last at least 60 years in the future. So how do you balance those emissions over its lifetime? That's a really critical um, uh, 
important thing to consider. And just to point out, you know, everything is voluntary so far, apart from, like I said, in the UK, the legislation has been introduced two years ago. Yes, so the key recommendations are that, you know, we need current um, and voluntary um, standards that deal with emissions and not just energy. And this needs to be integrated into national and local policy um, so that we can create and help this transition to climate neutral built environment. We also see that international net zero emission building definitions should provide some flexibility because Obviously, if you're dealing with, um, I don't know, if you have like a heritage building, for example, in Indonesia, maybe you can't touch the skin of the building, but that building still needs to improve its energy performance. So how do you do that? So clearly that, um, how do you say, retrofit of that uh, protected building cannot be expected to reach the same level of performance as, for example, a complete new build, you know, lab or, you know, so we need this flexibility and ambition levels. And just to point out, that's why, you know, we're talking about zero emission neighbourhoods now rather than buildings, because if you start to think about creating synergies um, in a neighbourhood context, you can actually uh, share energy between buildings. So those heritage buildings that can perform well could uh, maybe, you know, share energy from a more high performing uh, building. So the international standard should allow a variety of compensation uh, solution. I won't go into that, but it's a bit too much for now. So, but if you wanted to know more about this development of an international definition, here is the, the website or the uh, link. So now let's get on to um, uh, the actual building design. Um, I won't really, I don't think I should take questions right now as much as I would love to, um, yeah. because I think we're a little bit short of time. Mm -hmm. um, so if okay, I'll just move on. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So pathways to net zero. I thought best way is to show you some examples. So I'm drawing upon my own experience um, in Norway. So just a bit of background. Um, so Norway committed to becoming net zero actually as a country by 2030. Most countries are um, trying to achieve that by 2050. So how they did it is the um, Norwegian Research Council um, provided funding to set up these different research centers around the country. So it's very coordinated. So the research center that I was working in was to do with buildings, and that was on uh, the one in the bottom <laughs> icon. So, but there's other way, other pathways that we need to look at. So infrastructure, etc. So it's not just the buildings, but collectively you need all these different pathways to make the country and um, achieve that goal. So it was very well organized and it was well funded. So the vision of the Zen Centre was to create sustainable neighbourhoods with zero greenhouse gas emissions. So very simple. So whether you're looking at buildings or neighbourhood concepts, the key message is that you need to take into account the emissions of the operational use and the embodied emissions of the materials. Um, and you also need to th think about this in the life cycle perspective. So you need to be, in our case, we're talking about 60 years, but it could be 100 years, it could be 200 years, but you really need to get away from, not you, <laughs> we need to get away from that thinking of just on an annual basis. So how do we do that? We need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the energy used in the building and the material embodied emissions. We need to make our buildings more energy efficient, so using less energy. We need to really maximize opportunities for renewable energy production. So that could be PV on the roof, it could be wind, it could be tidal. There's many different types of renewables. And um, we need to reduce uh, the material use. So maybe making buildings more compact and, you know, and uh, instead of you know, I always remember being so inspired with a hotel that um, Ken Yang did in Malaysia. It was up near Penang, if I'm not wrong. And it was instead of the hotel, it was sitting on the top of a hill. 
and uh, it was facing the prevailing wind and he had a pool positioned and um, so the cool the air would come from the sea and go over the pool to cool it down and then all the sort of public areas you know like um what would you say like uh reception areas foyers etc they weren't air conditioned so they were just cooled through natural ventilation and other passive strategies um, but obviously, you know, it's very humid. So when you're sleeping, maybe you want to have uh, that ability to make a choice on putting air conditioning. So you could have that option in the bedrooms. But that way of thinking and the design, I, I just thought was so inspiring. So I think that's what really um, motivates me is, yes, we have a lot of knowledge in Norway, but I'm really curious to see how that knowledge can be implemented in different climatic contexts because the architecture will be very different and um, you know so if we look at a um, more passive design strategy to reduce the energy consumption to begin with try to use materials you know that are more locally sourced so you can um reduce transport emissions and try you know it says something about the architectural aesthetic of the place which is really important and try to um design for disassembly so thinking about how this building is going to be the materials are reused at the end of life how do we um how do you say reuse and recycle materials so what we're seeing anyway in norway is that this is an old slide now but you know you had um, a certain amount of energy use and then they made a change to the building code which was this tech 10 and then that helped to reduce the emissions uh, by what was it about a quarter and then they introduced um, a passive house standard in 2017 which also helped to reduce energy and then they introduced that legislation I was talking about nearly zero energy which reduced the energy consumption again but the key difference then was okay, we're reducing the energy, but we need to get away from thinking about buildings as consumers of energy. How do they become prosumers of energy? So producing more energy than they use. And that's where you start to see this, um, the importance of using renewable to create that balance. Yeah, and um, so in the end, actually, you start to produce more energy than the building uses, so you can feed that back into a grid, which is really important. So what is a ZEB, a zero emission building? So in a nutshell, you know, what I was talking about before, that the red on the left column is basically emissions from operations, so all the lighting, cooling, etc. in your building. What you're trying to do is to balance that with um, avoided emissions from renewables, so the green. And then what I was saying is, you know, not saying you have to plaster your building with PV by any means. I mean, you really need to use good design, uh, good passive design, good orientation, etc., to reduce that red part as low as possible, and um, so that you need very little, you know, renewable to actually balance that, that. And, you know, that could be PV, but it could be other um, renewables. And then don't forget the blue part, the embodied emissions of materials. So obviously, if you have a high tech building, that blue part is going to be very high. Um, whereas, for example, if you were to use more natural materials or vernacular uh, I don't know, locally sourced materials, that um, part of the equation becomes much less. So overall, you're really trying to reduce the blue and the red as low as possible through good design and good choice of materials. So when we talk about a life cycle perspective, so what I'm showing there, the green bubble is essentially, you know, you're producing green electricity from PV or it could be from another source. And then you can see the green bubble is much bigger than the orange bubble below it. So that's clearly more than enough to balance the energy used, the emissions from operation in the building. But you also need to um, include, you know, the embodied emissions from the materials used in the building. Um, but also, you know, you have to get those materials not just from the factory, they have to be transported, uh, you know, to your building site. So you have transport emissions to consider and um, when you're constructing the building, you need machinery. So 
again, you've got emissions that are needed for construction. And then finally, you know, demolishing your building. I mean, it takes energy to actually demolish, crush concrete, take the building apart. So those life cycle emissions are across, you know, all life cycle phases. So the green should be more than enough to balance all the orange bubbles, <laughs> keeping it quite simple. So we created these different ambition levels. So Zeb O is kind of like the lowest where you're trying to just balance the energy used in the building. Then OM is operation and materials. Then we include these progressive life cycle phases like materials, construction, transport emissions, and then the E, the Zeb Com E is the end of life, the demolishing part. So, and it's also really important to consider, you know, the electricity because you use an emission factor for the grid mix that you use because you're building, unless it's an autonomous building where it's a sort of building sitting on its own with PV um, and it's directly supplying the building. I mean, in most cases, the buildings produce more than they need. So it's really good to have that connection to the grid so it can help to green the country's um, grid. Um, but what we saw in Norway is because there's only four hours of daylight, you know, in the winter months that we need to import back into the country. And, um, you know, in those months, we don't have enough solar. So but that's bringing in kind of high carbon electricity. So it's, for us, it was really important to take into account where the electricity um, is sourced. OK, so why is it important to consider embodied emissions? Because the results from the pilots are showing us that if you look at the orange, that's emissions from operation. And um, so the pilots, you know, are very low. Um, how do you say they're very highly energy efficient, so they're using very little energy, but they're achieving that through using, in some cases, half a meter of mineral wool insulation. So that part becomes really high. So you can see that if you don't consider the embodied emissions, the gray part, you're missing a huge part of the picture. So and we also saw the results are showing us that, you know, for example, uh, PV obviously is a high driver of emissions because of all the components in it. Concrete is high, EPS is high. So for us, it was really important to understand this calculation and um, just even for a designer to know, OK, well, OK, the PV is high, but the PV is helping me balance my emissions. So I'll live with the fact I've got that's a high driver, but I'll make a conscious effort, as you can see with all the blues, the low blue, um, to try to use materials that have low um, embodied impact. Um, and, you know, certain materials do carry a high um, emission, like the concrete. Um, but then maybe you can look at switching the concrete for low carbon concrete, or in this case, we had EPS insulation and um, that high carbon. But it's really important in the cold country to have a really, you know, um, rigid insulation. So, like I said, there's trade offs, but the importance is, you know, to be aware of those materials that are driving higher or low emissions and just make um, a decision about it as an architect. So from research to real buildings, I hope <laughs> you're all hanging in there. It's a bit of a, a whistle stop, but hopefully it's giving you a snapshot. So just an overview to the ZEB Center, which was the predecessor to the Zen Center. The ZEB is the Zero Emission Building Research Center, and that ran from 2009 to 2017. That's when I was there. And, and the big thing is that it involved the university, Norwegian Technical um, University in Norway, um, with the research institution, Sintef, but it was really important to involve industry partners. So, you know, um, government officials, architects, manufacturers, everyone was involved from the very beginning. So it was really multidisciplinary. And, and the main objective was to produce products and solutions for not just new buildings, but existing buildings and coming up with solutions that really could be implemented today. So they couldn't be so high tech or so costly that, you know, you couldn't implement into practice. So they had to be realistic. 
and they had to consider that life cycle approach. So, you know, uh, where were they produced, the operation, the demolishing of the building. And also to build pilots that um, showcase strategies for different typologies. So not just residential, but commercial and public buildings. So the website is still available, so you can have a look and there's loads of publications and pilot projects, so you can um, I'll show two of them today. So just in terms of the research centre, I mean, we work at so many different scales. I mean, we were working, well, not me, but other researchers working at nano scale to develop, you know, um, new insulation materials and then scaling them up. Uh, you see this LECA block with insulation in it, and then testing them in these sort of uh, living labs, um, and then eventually building real buildings. But before all of that, or in parallel, we had to have a very clear definition, because there was no definition back in 2009. And how do we even calculate them? So we wanted to make sure that people weren't greenwashing. So that was a really core part, was how you calculate. So the key, I mean, essentially there's 10 key steps. Um, you know, the first is a bit hard to understand process and competence, but what that means is having the right people on board and having, you know, a multidisciplinary team who want to make the project happen. Then, you know, it's really important to maximize, you know, those passive design strategies like placement, good or understanding difference between north and south, the um, you know, placement of the building. So is the building close to a public transport hub? Then that could help to reduce transport emissions. Um, the form of the building, is it angled? Um, is it a flat roof, etc.? cetera? Um, so thermal insulation, uh, very important in colder countries. Um, it would be more probably shading for you. So again, that's really important to take the ZEB concept and look at how it would be different in different countries. And um, looking at daylighting, how do you, in, at least here, we want to kind of open up as much to the south, uh, so we get as much daylighting as possible to reduce that energy consumption for lighting, for example. And then once you've done the most that you can with good choice of materials, passive design strategies, then you start to look at, you know, balancing it with renewables and those sort of active systems that you may require. So I'll show you, give you a break from my voice. <laughs> so hopefully this will work. It's just a short minute and a half video. A powerhouse is an energy positive building that produces more energy than it uses. After 60 years, the building will offset the sum total of energy used in its construction, production of building materials, day-to-day -day running, and eventual demolition. This includes factoring in the energy consumption of all building materials used in Powerhouse. In fact, all building materials were carefully evaluated and selected based on how much energy was used to extract, manufacture, and transport them to the site. The sun is the source of energy production that is harvested by solar panels on the roof and facade. Powerhouse relies on the grid in winter, but compensates and exceeds this by generating far more energy than it consumes in summer. Much of this excess energy is distributed to neighboring buildings and infrastructure. During the lifespan of Powerhouse, it will have delivered a surplus of green and renewable energy to its surroundings. Okay, so let's see. Hopefully I can just move on to the next slide. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I don't seem to be able to move on. Hang on. Just click the arrow, right arrow. <clears throat> In your keyboard, it will work. Yeah, I might have to just stop. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Hang on. Let's see. Screen share. It was going too well. It was going too well. <laughs> I had to have a test. Okay. No. 
Oh no, I can't seem to move on. Uh, let's see if I can escape from full screen. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, see. maybe, uh, would you mind to try uh, clicking the right arrow in your keyboard? It will work that way, I believe. Yeah, I'm trying page up, page down. Right ah, arrow. right. So oh, wait, it's showing the video again. Like, if I could get out of um, oh yeah, yeah, if I, yeah. Just if I could get out of escape. the full screen, then yeah. I can just. But I can't see. Ah, nope. Let's try again. Perfect. Then I can just yeah. <laughs> the next. Yes. Okay. How am I doing time wise? By the way. Well, see. actually. Um, it's up to you because um, you have the appointment actually. Yeah. So we have we have time for your lecture actually. I could do maybe another ten minutes, and maybe we could just do another session another time. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's perfect. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, full screen. Okay, so the pilot projects are really important. Uh, they were a really vital part of the research because they act as innovation hubs. And so the researchers could come together with, you know, all these different industry partners, the students could come in and really start to see these buildings um, in real life. Um, and also the living labs help to verify and document um, what we you know simulated in in uh, research and see how it actually performed in practice and and then obviously they act as lighthouse uh, projects to disseminate the work so there's all of these are available um, on the zeb.no website but just to show that there's nine pilots that have been built and um, like i said the sec second column is showcasing different typologies and they're demonstrating strategies um, at different scale. So I'll just show you, for example, this first one, uh, Zeb House Multicomfort, uh, designed by Snohetta Architects, who you may be familiar, they did the Oslo Opera House. Um, so as you can see, you know, it's a single family residence, 200 square meters, and it achieved um, a balance for the operational energy use as well as the materials. So what you can see when we talk about the passive design strategy and um, all the buildings as much as possible, unless they're an existing building, will be orientated um, to, you know, the um, south as much as possible. And um, so what you can see here um, in that sort of site plan um, at the bottom is they're orientated in this case, it's actually to the southeast. And um, I'll just show you. Yeah, so you can see this tilt angle is uh, optimized at, in this case, it's about 19 degrees and it's uh, tilted to the south so that you're optimizing um, for the photovoltaics which are on the roof. And um, obviously the plan of the building is quite deep. Uh, so a way to um, encourage more daylighting was to introduce this uh, small sort of atrium and um, which helped to, you can see it there, uh, to get daylight from all angles. So that would uh, reduce the amount of electrical lighting that was used. And um, you can also see other uh, things, the material use, they used uh, recycled bricks from a project nearby. Uh, there was a lot of like wood available. So they were chopping down uh, the, you know, leftover wood actually from the factory could be cut and it was used in the facade material. You can see broken stone was put into these mesh uh, to form those sort of boundary walls. Um, and then the cladding is uh, using, it's a sort of a burnt wood, an old Japanese technique where you burn the outside uh, layer of the wood. Um, and that 
stuff that helps you um, save on embodied emissions for maintenance because it doesn't rot and um, because it sort of seals the wood. So in a nutshell, I mean, this would show you, for example, a typical um, feature of the Z buildings is this tilting to, you know, the south, southeast, so that you can maximize the area for the photovoltaics. And um, you can see in this one, you have a mixture of, you know, photovoltaics for electricity generation, but you can see in the middle in yellow are the ones to um, heat water. So they're more like um, a solar thermal collector. And um, you can also see then the atrium so that you get good daylight into the building. Um, and then, you know, if it's facing south, uh, they were using reused brick. Uh, you can see the thermal mass. Um, so that would absorb the heat. And then it's like a radiant heat into the space. Um, and then other features would be, like I said before, half a meter of um, mineral wool insulation is quite typical. So they're quite airtight buildings. But like I said, that's the interesting thing is that that is a, um, a, a prototype that suits that cold, dry climate. But it's very interesting to take the theory and see how could you create a ZEB in, in Indonesia with a very different climatic context. So what other features? I mean, there was a grey water heat recovery, radiant floor heating, and um, you've got this boiler which gets heated water from the solar collectors. Energy well, that's another feature where you're drilling um, sort of pipes um, down into the ground um, and then you get free heat from the ground. So again, places like Iceland, and um, you know, geothermal is really common there. So they get a sort of free source of heat. Um, and actually, you know, there they don't even bother insulating uh, the walls of the buildings or having double, um, you know, with the glazing, double glazing, because they have so much free heat, they just open the windows. So that's really not, it's environmental, but it's not obviously the way that we should be thinking. It should be about trying to, um, you know, really conserve that energy as much as possible. So other things would be, you know, in terms of materiality, like I was saying, uh, sorry, this is still in Norwegian, but you have the photovoltaics on the roof, you've got the recycled brick from another project, which actually adds to the architecture. Um, and then you have this wall, uh, which is used, you know, this sort of sliced uh, leftover wood Again, it gives a very nice feature uh, to, to the wood. And then you have the, the cladding in Norway, it's typically pine or spruce. So it's a very um, low dense species of wood. So it grows very quickly. So once you cut it down, it can be replenished. And, and instead of sort of painting or um, adding, you know, uh, a lot of, um, how do you say, um, chemicals you know to maintain it you just burn and char the outside wood layer so what's interesting even for that uh, thermal wall you know the first idea was to use uh, concrete and then uh, if you switched it for low carbon concrete you could reduce uh, the um, energy and body emissions and then they decided to uh, go for the reuse bricks so you can see there was a huge saving there and then again, you can see the drivers for high embodied emissions would be photovoltaics and, and insulation. <clears throat> and then I think I'll just end up with this last uh, case study, and um, because I think it's quite interesting for you um, to see. So this one is a living lab which was built um, on site on campus in Trondheim, um, and it was a living lab, so different uh, social demographic groups so it could be a group of students it could be older people it could be a single person a, a family so they brought these different people in and then they would monitor how they use the building because of course it's really good to design the best building in the world but it depends how people actually use it so this one and um, it's located on campus like i said you can see again the orientation it's, um, you know, uh, the long axis actually is east-west, so you have maximum exposure to the south. Um, and what you can see in this case is this double uh, profile roof, um, which helped to increase the area of PV. 
um, it was also lifted up from the ground. And concrete emissions are quite high in the foundations uh, for most EBS. Um, even if you can help reduce emissions in the skin of the building using wood. Um, so what a decision was made then to switch from a foundation, a strip, um, like a pad foundation, to change to a strip foundation, which uh, obviously reduced the quantity of concrete by, you know, let's say half, which associated in reducing the embodied emissions because there's less concrete used. So it's those simple design switches that actually can make a very big impact on um, how much emissions are used in the building. And then just in terms of how it's insulated, again, typical of Norway, it's about half a meter of insulation. So we did this uh, life cycle assessment um, on a 60 year basis. I won't go into this, but we included, you know, production phase, construction and some use phase. And then these are the results. Uh, nothing surprising. I mean, obviously, the outer roof was high in emissions. Uh, but that's because it had the PV and it had this half meter of um, insulation. Uh, outer walls were quite high because they were experimenting with like phase change materials, et cetera, and vacuum insulated panels. Yeah, so essentially some key takeaways would be, you know, the roof was high in emissions. So from the whole building, the highest driver was actually the roof component. And what was driving that was, like I said, you know, the insulation and the PV. And then, you know, the switch from this pad foundation to a strip foundation really helped to reduce the amount of, um, how do you say, concrete that was used and the associated embodied emissions. So this is just sort of showing you that balance. And then I'll just end up here. So yeah, the pilots are really important, you know, to actually test in practice and, um, you know, how these uh, strategies are working uh, for students to be able to come and visit buildings and transfer knowledge to the Norwegian building industry. So if you want to know more, this is the website. You can look at all the pilots, look at our publications. And I'll have to, I won't have time to go now into the neighborhood scale, but I'll just, um, I'll just end with this, I guess, because, you know, it's not just all about number crunching. We want to really create an architecture of the place. Uh, but, you know, it's important for us as architects to understand, you know, if I choose you know, if a proper understanding of orientation, form, choice of materials will really impact, you know, the environmental impact of the building. But we can make those sustainable buildings very beautiful as well. So that's the, the beauty of really understanding research and early phase design. So it can inform your decisions. But ultimately, it's us as architects that will make those final decisions about how we give a a sense of place, how do we include those tectonic qualities that are so important to delivering a beautiful place, the health benefits of good choice of materials, etc. So I tried to look up what thank you was in Indonesia, but I'm not sure if this is correct. And whether I know Salamat Datang is more of a, a welcome, so I wasn't sure what to put down. But either way, thank you. And here are some links. Uh, so I'll end there. Okay, thank you, Eva. <laughs> uh, and that's correct. Thank you, Istari Makasi. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, yeah, I've I think... never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, really? Um, how do you say thank you in Malaysian? You were in Malaysia before. Well, it's so long ago, but I just remember Salamat that, that time, but that's more of a welcome, isn't it? Yeah, it's a welcome. Uh, yeah. We have almost the same kind of language, so I believe yeah. that it's almost the same. So it will be terima kasih as well. Okay, well, I never obviously said thank you. So. <laughs> okay, now, okay. Um, so do you have uh, time for question and answer, maybe a short one? Or... Maybe just a few minutes, because um, ah. unfortunately I have uh, yeah. the next meeting. But, you know, I'd be happy to talk again for sure. So. Okay. 
Okay, so maybe one question from students. Okay, there's one student. Already. Oh, two. Uh, is it okay for two students yeah. asking? Yeah. Okay, so there will be uh, Ahmad Faza first. Yeah, hello. Hello, um, Professor Ifa. Um, I think it is uh, my pleasure to be able to ask you a question uh, here in this occasion. And yeah, first of all, my name is Faza and I'm on the fifth semester of uh, undergraduate students at architecture department of ITS. And uh, first of all, your presentation is um, very insightful. I think it is um, very good and um, it sparks a lot of questions in my head, but I think I just yeah. want to uh, ask one question. Um, maybe uh, I would like to know uh, what is your thought and uh, on the implementation and regulation of um, sustainable uh, approach or maybe uh, reducing future carbon in the third world countries or in the developing countries, because um, I think it will uh, it would be rather easy to regulate um, all of this change uh, in a richer country or a more developed country uh, rather than. Uh, a country that may be like um, uh, Indonesia, for example, because um, I think when it comes to third world countries or developing countries, um, economy and politics play a huge role uh, in terms of changing the uh, changing the sustainable uh, approach of uh, of how we design. So I would I, I was just wondering, uh, what is your thought on that, and uh, maybe you can you can give us uh, some of your perspective. Thank well, you. Thank you, Faza. Um, well, you see, this is the, the reason in a way that I'm really interested to give this talk, because it's an area of research that I'm particularly very interested in, because a lot of uh, the research that has been done to date is, as you correctly say, in developing countries, a lot of the solutions are quite high tech, so they're high cost. Um, but you know, if we want to reduce global emissions, we need to come up with solutions that can be implemented in developing countries and they need to be more affordable. So it's actually a topic of research. I have um, a PhD researcher at the moment working on exactly that topic. And um, so what we've been doing is taking these uh, concepts but what we, we would love to do is to find some pilot projects where it could be working with students in the first instance to start to sort of share that knowledge. And um, so in a way, you know, if we're waiting for policy legislation, I mean, that will all take time. And of course, we need that, you know, to implement changes in, um, in practice. But the beauty of education is it doesn't take that much, well, <laughs> it wouldn't take that much effort. And, and if we could find a small project uh, where we could have this knowledge exchange, it would be terrific because you could set it as a topic in studio and you, the students, could almost um, learn from what's been done in other countries, but you would have the expertise because you know and um, the climate that you're working with, you would be more familiar with the vernacular design principles that you could then, you know, it's about sort of maybe us coming with a bit knowledge on this approach, but how it can be adapted for a different climate and more affordable. And another area of research that we're interested in is, you know, designing solutions that are more climate resilient because a lot of the work before has been on reducing the impact for net zero, like greenhouse gas emissions, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily resilient to disasters. So how do you design, you know, for future disaster resilience as well as climate resilience? Do you know what I mean? So say with climate change, you might have, for example, tsunami, or you could have other extreme effects. So how do you design buildings to withstand those? And that's a really critical area of research. So my feeling would be, you know, to kind of kickstart uh, the work through student involvement and staff student exchange is probably the quickest way to implement rather than, um, you know, waiting for policy change. 
because even when you get policy change or legislation, it's very hard for young architects to really understand what does that mean in terms of design, you know? So it's really important to develop a design guidance that's really um, easy to understand. So <laughs> that's what I'd say. Yeah, yes. thank you very much, uh, Professor Eva, for the answer. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay, now let's move on to the second uh, question from Fernanda. Okay, Fernanda. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fancy, and uh, good afternoon, Ms. Eva. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet you, and uh, it is an insightful and inspirational lecture. Um, thank you for that also. Uh, I want to ask about the, previously you said that, that uh, existing building can also be um, processed or altered to become a zero carbon. My question is exactly, can an existing building become a 100%, maybe a zero emission or zero carbon building? Then what needs to be done to achieve mm -hmm. it? And yeah. will it alter the original function or maybe shape or everything, anything about uh, that particular building? Uh, yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, yes. No, because that's a, a very good question. And that's where, as an architect, if you're working together, you know, with somebody who has a background, for example, in zero emission, you can look and, and look at different ways. So, for example, in studio just a few years ago, we took a derelict building and we were looking, first of all, at what are the, the options for that building and, you know, to make it more energy efficient and zero carbon. So one you could consider, you know, maybe that whole area needs something new. Uh, so maybe one option is to actually demolish the building and reuse the materials in another way. So you have to kind of, before getting to the design, you have to understand the urban context in which you're your building and understand what is needed to regenerate that particular area. So you kind of have to look outside of the building itself. So the students sort of looked at one option where, you know, it was um, a part of the, the city uh, that was very run down, it wasn't very safe. And, you know, together with the municipality, they wanted to bring more young people. So they looked at this option of demolishing and creating new housing for younger families, etc. And then reusing those materials as much as possible. The other was that they looked at what if they just left the building exactly as it was, you know, so leaving the skin of the building. So you preserve that cultural heritage. How can you work? behind the scenes as such. So what they looked at was actually starting to create um, a sort of a building within the building. So they looked at creating this sort of lightweight timber and um, smaller like cubes within the bigger space in the building. So they could create the environmental and thermal uh, comfort that was needed for new functions within the space. And um, and they could control that, but then they left the skin of the building exactly as it was. So it almost became like an art piece. And then the sort of middle ground was actually making interventions to that building. So they looked at putting um, in the floor, they did this radiant floor heating. And it meant this was connected to PVs on the roof. Um, but it meant then that the um, walls of the building uh, wouldn't be touched. So because the thing is with an old building, if you start to put on insulation on the inside, you're not letting the, the building breathe in the way that it was originally designed for. So you can't just suddenly implement, you know, uh, sort of very, how do you say, airtight solutions because the building wasn't designed for that. So. There's many, it's a good thing to A, understand, do really deep analysis of the urban context, understand 
the actual building to understand which materials and fabric are beyond decay or repairable or actually should be um, reused in another context. And you need that deep understanding before you can start exploring different options. And the final thing is just, you know, that building, if you want to preserve it in its uh, original context, maybe it can't really perform extremely well. So in that case, you can start to connect it into other buildings where you could generate more electricity, for example, and then share the energy between the buildings. So the neighborhood becomes lower. So that's another, um, so creating synergies. So there's many options. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. so, so I hope that answers. Yeah. Thank you for the answers, Eva. Okay, thank you, Professor Eva, for a great yeah. lecture today. And um, you, we have a short discussion with the students, and it helps definitely the student to understand how we um, uh, incorporate the understanding of reducing future carbon uh, into design because it's something new that we haven't heard yeah. before. Uh, but it's already applied in any other countries. So uh, it's very inspiring for our students. Thank yes. you for your coming today. Okay. And we hope that we will have another meeting, maybe collaboration in the future. Yeah. So um, thank you for students as well for coming and some lectures okay, here thank you. to attend uh, the guest lecture. Uh, and good afternoon, Professor Eva. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for the mis the misunderstanding before. <laughs> yeah. So good morning. Um, yeah, good morning. Good morning. Oh my God. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um. Thank you again, and I'll okay. uh, see you in the next meeting, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Meeting. yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Um, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Baik, uh, saya kembalikan ke Pak Iwan kalau yang sudah yeah. sama mahasiswa, silakan Pak Iwan. Iya, yeah. uh, terima kasih sekali uh, Bu Venti uh, atas uh, apa, panduannya tadi dari Profesor uh, Iva. Ya, saya, saya juga bingung ini Bu. Iva ternyata bacanya. Ternyata, ternyata Iva. Profesor Iva. Yeah. Baik, uh, terima kasih kepada rekan-rekan mahasiswa uh, 